Well, welcome everybody to our BCUG graphics workshop on June 15th, 2023. Got a lot to talk about, got some interesting participants, and hopefully if you want to say something, feel free to do that. Can I tell you what happened to me recently? Ralph, what happened to you recently? Uh, I bought a printer that was for photographs in 2017. And two weeks ago, the printer head went. So I went to investigate how much it would be. To buy the printer head it was a pro Canon Pro 10. To buy a printer head, and you have to install it, which is apparently not an easy job, was $250. So it's, and a new one, the, the, that model is $1,300 because it's out of stock. So I decided not to buy to buy a new one. I wound up with the Pro 200, and I had to make a decision between the Pro 200 and the Pro 300. And I found out something very interesting, which I didn't know, that there are th two different types of ink. You can get a dyed ink or a, um, uh, I forgot the other type of ink, the one that regular, you know, that's normal. And I decided to go with the dyed ink. Apparently it makes better pictures and it, it's about the same price, but the printer takes eight cartridges as opposed to the 300, which takes 10 cartridges, which is more. But uh, the dyed ink has a life expectancy of 80 years, and the other ink has a life expectancy of 100 years. But I went with the 80 one because they, you know, they told me it was better for, for the brightness is better and stuff like that. I've since made a couple of pictures, and I, I could see the difference. Well, I think you should have gone for the 100 years. Be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so all about you. Outside. It's about the people who come after you. That's right. right. But, but, <laughs> but I, I went with the, better, with the better picture quality. I didn't even know there was such a thing as two different types of ink. Yeah, I, I think it's called sublimation printing. I'm not sure what it is. It's not that. I... I I know the word, I just can't remember the word. It'll come to me later. Sublimation? No. I think so. Okay, maybe, I don't know. Well, uh, anyway, uh, I have all kinds of stuff to uh, go over with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Unless somebody else has something that happened to them that they'd like to share. Sandy Duma? No, no. <laughs> Has anybody been using a regular camera? I have a Panasonic camera. Yeah, it's, I have. I use I use a regular camera. I call them real cameras, as opposed to um, as opposed to using your cell phone. Yeah, right. I mean, nowadays, unless you're a real aficionado, doing a what you got a, a thirty-five millimeter camera, and then you got a a, a single lens reflex. And then you got a mirrorless camera, and you got a point and shoot, and then you got your cell phone. Right. But the difference is, I shoot in RAW. So we're. Uh, Ralph, does your wife know about that? <laughs> so what happens you can, is. You can shoot RAW with a cell phone. I know, but the, the, the number of pixels you get is a lot less. My typical file is 80 megs, whereas a cell phone is like 10 megs. And it makes it like I like printing in uh, 13 by 19. And it makes a difference. Oh, one thing this new printer does, which the other printer didn't do, you could print panoramic pictures. It's not limited to 13 by 19. It's limited to 13 by, I'm not so sure how much the, the, the length is, but you put it in a different port and it, and it really takes, you could, you could actually shoot, pan, like on a cell phone, you could shoot panoramic pictures. You, 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 you take the picture every couple of seconds and you, you have a whole landscape. I'm not sure if my regular camera could do that, but I know I have taken panoramic pictures. I just wasn't able to print them. But now you can print them, you know, to make them really large. I'm not sure what the maximum length is. But it's oh, that's big. like a banner? Yeah, like a banner. You got to have a piece of <laughs> photo paper that's that long. Yeah, they sell them in rolls. In rolls. <laughs> ah. So one of the things that I found out when I was doing some panoramic work, 
and you go snap, 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 you know, you put all the pictures together and get a nice panoramic view. Uh, you end up missing pieces in different parts. That's how good you are. You got to be really slow. You don't even have to be good anymore because I was just uh, seeing that with artificial intelligence in Photoshop, I could figure out everything that's missing and make up all the, the parts that need to be there. Quite amazing. Which is something that we might get into in September. Which, which is what I was going to say. Why don't you show us how to do it in Photoshop? I'd like a lesson to learn how to use Photoshop. I have it, but I'm not that good at it. I'm sure well, I'll of... let you know what to do. There's Richard Bradford coming all the way from Australia. Is that right? Good morning, yes. Well, good morning. Good morning, Richard. Richard. <laughs> and welcome. Yeah, those panoramic okay. views. Um, uh, when you snap the photos, Australia, they right? overlap, they stitch the photos together, and you can go right around the full 360 degrees. By the way, uh, we that have was a just announced. Of your, I was uh, going to, excuse picture. me, I, I was going to comment on that. Uh, Richard, is that the Google has uh, an app which it is about to become free for anyone to use on their cell phone, uh, on their smartphone, that it's a part of Google's map view and you can take full 360 degree pictures with it. Yeah. The same yeah. way that, so that you can and save them on your own machine. Yeah. So that it's the same way as when you're in Google Street View, you can on Google Maps, you can go up and down and all around. Well, you now will be able to take those pictures yourself. Yeah. I, know, I, I, I have been around for a number of years, so I I used it uh, on my cell phone, oh, it would have been about uh, six or seven years ago. I was uh, using it when I was uh, in Macau, using uh, the cell phone. Thing is, how do you print, how do you print those, Richard? No, uh, just, just show, it, show it up on the computer screen. It uh, just shows up as a long, thin strip. Yeah. Well, that the thing is, we were just talking about my new printer will actually print oh. like big strips, yeah. like a like, banner. Right? It's, it's, it's right. not going to print a 360 degree picture, but this was coupled with the introduction of the new Apple um, AR goggles. Apple just brought those out at $3,500 or something, but they're saying, well, now with this Google 360 degree full sphere imaging, you'll be able to use that in the Apple goggles, AR goggles. So I think when I took the photos, you had the uh, Google AR uh, goggles, they were made out of cardboard and you slip your, your smartphone in the uh, back of the cardboard. Right. Just... We, we have been, we've studied that a few years ago, right, Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Bill Silverman. Bill handed them out. I still got mine downstairs. <laughs> and there, there's nothing new with the 360 degree viewing. You can do that with the uh, yeah. Quest 2, the Oculus, virtual yeah. reality. So that's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, start this meeting because I definitely <laughs> <laughs> want to get some things finished up. So I'm going to go to screen sharing, unless somebody else has something they want to add at this time. Okay, screen sharing. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, so okay, I got some people in the waiting room. We got guest Andy. I don't know who Andy is. Harrigan. Ah, Andy? Say hi, Andy. He's still logging okay. in. And then we have guests that a telephone number, whoever that might be. So that'll be Andy also. Yeah, yes, sir. So everybody at this point, I hope you're in.
And now you should be able to see my screen. Yes? BCUG Graphics Workshop, June 15th, 2023. Well, a good Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. Happy Father's Day, everybody. And uh, there's a, a quote that was sent to me by Billy Graham. He didn't send it to me, he said it. A uh, good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. So happy Father's Day, everybody who's a father or has had a father. Note that there will be no graphics workshop during the summer, that being July and August. And hopefully we will meet again in September. And as John was mentioning, for three and a half thousand dollars, you do could go bankrupt <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the Vision Pro, Apple's Vision Pro. Uh, here's a picture of what it looks like. It'll do AR, augmented reality, and VR, virtual reality. And here's a little something about it. At that price, $3,499 and tax, uh, it won't be an easy task to pull off making money. Uh, the, the price of this item is, is such that it, it barely covers the cost of the main components, which are its camera, a sensory array, and dual Apple Silicon chips and the twin 4K micro organic light emitting diode virtual reality displays. But if you could get your head into one of these just to experience it, it'd probably blow your mind. So make sure you have the appropriate insurance. Bill, does everybody know? Bill? Augmented versus virtual reality. Those are new terms to me. Uh, augmented reality. Bill, if you look around and you see your room and you're wearing a headset that shows you augmented reality, you'll see your room, but overlaid over your environment would be something that adds to it. For instance, maybe directions about how to fix a broken pipe or something in your car. Or maybe you'll see an avatar standing there talking to you, but within your own room, within your own environment. Whereas virtual reality puts you in a different environment completely. And if you experience virtual reality in 3D, in 360 degrees, you would be absolutely willing to bet that you're not in your regular environment. You are someplace that is just extraordinary. So if you have a chance to experience it, go for it. Okay, Bill? I am very interested. Yes. Yes. If you want, Bill, you can even come visit me and I'll give you a, a demo. <laughs> so I have a, uh, an Oculus Quest 2. Yeah. After the meeting, maybe we can work something out. Yeah, okay. Now, my wife and I went to a uh, virtual, what well, we went, what was it? Oh, it, it was an immersive experience of Van Gogh's paintings. Van Gogh, uh, the immersive experience. And after the experience for another $10, I think it was, you went into a separate room, you sat on a swivel chair, and you put on an Oculus Quest 2 headset and you were transported into a Van Gogh painting, Starry Night, 360 degrees of freedom to look up, look down, look around. And in 3D, and you moved through that painting and then transitioned into another painting by Van Gogh and then into another painting. It was uh, amazing. So, Bill, if you come over one day, I'll, I'll show it to you because I can't access the Starry Night part of it. Pretty neat. And then I went to the King Tut immersive experience with my uh, grandkids. 
and again, well, here yeah, they charge us twenty dollars, and you put on the, the same kind of headset, and you were inside King Tut's tomb. You know, just trying to imagine what the experience is, I really can't. I think you have to actually experience. Well, you will. You will feel like you are really there. Good. Okay. So, uh, just a comment about the augmented reality. Um, saw a report all oh, would have been two or three years ago about potential surgeons using it uh, with a with the image from um, a CT scan. So when they're looking at the patient, they they can with the augmented reality that shows the uh, potential tumor or something inside an organ mm -hmm. and that makes it look as though that organ's semi-transparent for the surgeon. So, so they're able to basically cut them open and know exactly where they're cutting. Which so is nice to know that. So that was, that was the practical idea of how augmented reality might be able to be used. Mm -hmm. Richard, by the way, I, I, nobody knows what your whole head looks like. What we're seeing is a little piece of your face. <laughs> and now we have the, the whole hairy experience. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on, Photoshop. So our graphics group has been together almost 25 years. And I don't know how many of you were there when Andrea Tarr was the leader. She did for 10 years. And she always did a presentation first, something from Corel, Corel Draw. And then we moved up to Photoshop. And we haven't done anything really much in Photoshop in ages. But with augmented, not augmented, with artificial intelligence, Photoshop is starting to have all kinds of new stuff related to that. So uh, Photoshop, here's a quick survey. How many of you use Photoshop? Still use it. I still use it. Uh, say yes if you do. I have it, but I don't use it much. I use Lightroom instead. Uh-huh, which is also an Adobe product. Bill, what about you? I'm not currently active with anything. Well, uh, the, in, in the Linux meeting last night, we were talking about GIMP, and there were several members who use GIMP instead of Photoshop, and they use it regularly. I think Drew King was one of them and Dick Maybach was another one. And um, we, I asked them, I said, hey, could you give a presentation about GIMP to the graphics group? I mean, we've had that from Lee Maxwell years ago, but we haven't talked about it lately. And if somebody doesn't want to spend the money on, on uh, Photoshop, which most people don't, uh, unless they're getting reimbursed because they're using it for business, Right. Uh, GIMP, people all said that it it is just as good as Photoshop. I have GIMP installed, and whenever I need to do certain things, I have a lot of specialized programs that do most of the things that I need to do. And on my iPhone, which is where I take most of my pictures now, it has all kinds of editing capabilities built right into the iPhone so I rarely need to do anything that requires Photoshop. John, do you prefer to do your editing on the iPhone rather than working with the PC? There's nothing that I haven't found a way to do on the iPhone. I'm impressed. <laughs> I mean, they, they, I have a whole bunch of extra apps that are free from the Apple store, but just the regular editing that's built into the photo uh, app that comes with the iPhone is capable of doing everything that most people need, including that I use other apps if I want to overlay something, but it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, you could even remove the background and extract something from a picture and paste it into some other picture. 
Was that with GIMP or with the iPhone editor? With the iPhone. And Maybe because because, because people have, have their have iPhones players. with them all the time, unless you have a special need for uh, something, but the way people share pictures, they're not interested in multi gigabyte images usually. You've got to have special needs for that. Well, I used GIMP briefly for a while, quite a while back on the, on a Windows PC, and that was to display those uh, the new HEIF type files. But uh, I found GIMP was very slow to start up on a PC because there's, there's so much in it. It uh, takes quite a bit of time to load up. Okay, folks, I'm going to move on because it is getting a little late. Just wanted to point out that with Photoshop, uh, if, if you want it, you can get a free trial. It goes for about 30 days. But if you want to, to buy it, you got to do it by subscription. As we all know, it costs about $21 a month, month after month after month after month after month forever, uh, which is why hardly anybody in our group uses it unless you're a professional uh if you're a student or a teacher active teacher you can get 60 percent off of creative cloud which has all of the apps including photoshop and so much more and you can get that for 19.99 a month but you got to prove that you're a working teacher or an active student Next thing, uh, what topics would you like to have covered in this graphics workshop? I've covered an awful lot way beyond Photoshop in the nearly 15 years that I've been running the group. So if you have any anything that you can think of that you'd like us to get into next September, October, November, December, and beyond, mention it now or any time in the future. Bill, does anything come to mind with you? Well, I'm kind of a newbie, so anything having to do with GIMP or the iPhone editor, you have my attention. Okay, that's something maybe John could do a presentation for us on. Yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to see the Photoshop. You know, I, I've been here a couple of years and no one ever did Photoshop. I mean, oh, you did it a while good. ago, but yeah. I don't know. You know okay. I think that was before you joined the club, Ralph. That's what I mean, yeah. But, you know, just because, you know, I'm sure there's new stuff on Photoshop. Even the people who had, who saw the demonstrations be able, you know, like to see it again or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, at one point, we used to have a summer school where we would just do an introduction to Photoshop for the July and the August meetings for new people like Ralph. But we haven't done that in quite a few years. Anyway, you can get free tutorials from Colin Smith. I'm up to number five now. Uh, Colin Smith, free tutorials in Photoshop and Lightroom. Colin Smith is a, a very good presenter and his website is photoshopcafe.com. You might want to note that down, photoshopcafe.com. He's got a load of videos available on YouTube. Again, they're all free. Uh, he also runs courses where you pay, and his latest course was just recently about generative fill-in in Photoshop using artificial intelligence functions that's built in. And there's a video about it where for about three minutes he introduces a, a little bit about what you can do with this new functionality. If you go to the website photoshopcafe.com uh, you can go to their photoshop vault and download all sorts of free stuff as indicated here uh, you can download a book for free about layers and blend modes in photoshop different brushes uh, just all kinds of stuff so check that out Again, it's photoshopcafe.com. And you'll see a link for the Photoshop Cafe Vault. 
once you register with him uh you'll be able to get all this great stuff for free and then again you have loads and loads and loads of free tutorials photoshop and lightroom available at his website and most of it's posted on youtube it it would be good to be able to uh see how to use some of these uh uh line editing type programs like Librecad, cad which i think is uh, the free version of autocad uh, for, for for producing the um uh so what dxf type files and things and some of those uh files are used then used by uh programs like laser cutters or um, mm -hmm. by the way Richard and everybody else I skipped over one thing that I really wanted to go over here and that is after talking about what topics would you like to have covered next thing is are you willing and able to be a presenter yourself and share some of your knowledge and Richard I suspect you might be such a person am I right uh, sort of a, my knowledge is sort of very limited and scattered I'm afraid <laughs> well you know if you really want to learn a topic they say become a teacher teach it <laughs> yes mm. so if you have an interest in delving into something further anybody something that really interests you if you want to volunteer to be a presenter for 15 minutes half an hour an hour or the whole two hours let me know well how, how old are you i i suspect that everybody here is over age over, over the three score, three over score age. Age. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about cancer uh let's see on may 26 2021 the american cancer society introduce new guidelines it used to be once you hit 50 years old you should have a colonoscopy done just as a, a baseline for further reference as you get older and I'm sure that many of you have had this wonderful experience now they're recommending 45 get your baseline 45 so if you have any kids that are at that age it's time to start thinking about getting a colonoscopy but what if you're 78 as I am well I decided when I was due for a colonoscopy last year I decided to do one of those tests where you drop a little stool sample and mail it in well uh colonoscopy here in Australia, they have, uh, the government posts those kits out to everyone over 50, encourages them to send in for a free test. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm having a little trouble understanding you, Richard. Do you have I a, say here, do you have a here uh, uh, everyone over 50 um, gets one of those kits in the post. Yes. The government encourages them to get a free test done mm -hmm. for, to check check for cancer so I sent out a notice to everybody uh that I'm friendly with I, I I'm gonna repeat that for your benefit and for you to share with others there's an important new breakthrough and if you look on the the bottom of my your your screen my screen I'll read it uh, important new breakthrough colonoscopy no longer needed Colagard, which is where you send in your stool sample, is no longer needed. Knowing your age, likely 50 years old or older, I thought that you would be delighted to know, as I was, that there is an alternative. Now you can just send in a stool sample, and you can even use the convenience and accuracy of 3D printing. Yes, Sandy Duba. You look surprised about that. Well, shown below, and you'll see it in a moment if you if you're interested, <laughs> is my finished 3D printed stool sample ready to be delivered to my gastroenterologist for analysis. 
if you want to do the same thing with your stool samples, speak to your your gastroenterologist. Now I'm going to show you a photo of my stool sample, 3D printed. And th this is what uh, I presented to my gastroenterologist. He looked a little confused. You got me good. It. He took it to send it. Bill, I, I assume you've done the same sort of thing, right? Done the real stool samples, not That's the real stool sample. Yes, it's 3D printed. Uh, actually, John, thank you. John sent this to me, I think. Right, John? Yeah. So as I said, it was a 3D printed stool sample. It took a while to get a good and complete sample to come out, but it was worth the effort. Um, by the way, 3D printing is a major technology being used in a diverse number of very important ways. I have already devoted the last two months meetings of the graphics workshop that I run for my computer club to this topic and will continue to explore its uses for our June meeting, concentrating this time on the medical uses of 3D printing. Bill. So that's what I sent out to my friends. Some of them appreciated and are still talking to me. 3, 3D printing topics already covered during the last two, excuse me, two months. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at various videos about the concept of 3D printing, what it is. Then we found out that you could 3D print a house, the whole house, the whole community. Then we found out you could 3D print a rocket, as Elon Musk does, SpaceX. And you could 3D print things up in that rocket when you're in outer space. And then if you want to colonize the moon or Mars and build a habitat there, you can do it with 3D printing. They're working on it right now. So that's what we covered the last two months. So tonight we will continue moving on from folders one, two, and three into folder number four. Folder number four is about human and animal 3D printing in terms of medical uses. If we have time, we'll go over some really amazing projects like building a Lamborghini car for yourself. We'll talk about new technology in 3D printing and how you can get into doing 3D printing on your own, what's available for the new 3D printer person. And then to wrap up everything, I have a 26 minute documentary all about the 3D printing revolution. It would be impossible to cover all this in the next two months, but I hope we'll get through number four. And as we get through folder four, here are some terms that we will be exposed to. First one, regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine. Say that to yourself a few times. Ralph, what is it? There you go. Ralph, I have to get everyone to participate. I have no idea. No, just read it. Regenerative medicine seeks to replace tissues or organs that have been damaged by disease, trauma, or congenital issues. Continue. Regenerative medicine is focused on developing and applying new treatments to heal tissues and organs and restore function that lo lost due to aging, disease, damage, or defects. And all of us are at that age or beyond where we may, we may depend on regenerative medicine to keep going and have a quality of life in our remaining years. Another topic that we'll get to when we start looking at building 3D printed bones, it's called ceramic omnidirectional bioprinting in cell suspensions. You can say that to yourself a few times. But that's related to 3D printing of bones. 
How many of you are familiar with TED? Yes, yes, TED, yes. TED. Yep. stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. Sandy Duma, would you read for us about TED and what it stands for? Sandy Duma, can you help us out? Sandy is no longer here. Uh huh. Okay, well, I'll do it. Uh, John, how about you, John? PED stands for Technology, Entertainment, Design, three broad subject areas that are collectively shaping our world. But a TED conference is broader still, showcasing important research and ideas from all disciplines and exploring how they connect. Right. And one of the things we're going to listen to tonight is a, a TED discussion about 3D printing. Then, uh, if we have time, we'll get to be. Kieran, Kieran, Kieran. Uh, unfortunately, this is a person who was born without fingers on his right hand, suffering from amniotic band syndrome, something I doubt you have ever heard of. And neither did I until I watched this video. Then we're going to take a look at a mind control 3D printed body parts like a prosthetic arm prosthetic referring to a device designed to replace a missing part of the body or to make a part of the body work better and then when we're finished with that i'll ask you what you think about 3d printing so uh here we go i'm gonna go to folder number four open it up and in here I have oh, 11 short videos. I think you'll find them extraordinary. So, number one. The story of the Starfleet crew taking on a murderous alien force disappointed critics and Trekkies alike. Star Trek. But the movie did at least retain key themes from the TV series, including science that was believable. The movie's alien being has its roots in reality. The NASA space probe Voyager is sent out and lost in the 1970s, only to reemerge three centuries later, having developed artificial intelligence and the capability to create lifelike androids. This is a mechanism. <laughs> At the time, replicating humans was the stuff of pure science fiction. But today, scientists are on the verge of making this a reality. I was a big Star Trek fan growing up, and what inspired me the most about uh, Star Trek was the fact that you would see all these technologies that were totally science fiction, which of course today are reality. By the way, this is Alan Atola. Uh, he's going to do a TED presentation that we're going to see a little later. Dr. Anthony Atala, an expert in tissue engineering, is a lifelong Trekkie. His groundbreaking work, which involved using printers to produce 3D human body parts, could have come straight out of a Roddenberry script. That's a nose, 3D printed nose. Not finished yet, but that's the scaffolding, as it's called. One of our printers that uh, we've designed and what you see here is this print head on the top, very much like a regular uh, desktop inkjet printer that you would have at your home, really. But instead of using uh, ink, we're basically using cells. Using x-rays and scans, Dr. Atala builds a computer 3D reconstruction of a body part one layer at a time. Each layer is then physically printed using a mixture of a patient's own cells and biomaterial gel. This creates a 3D structure exactly like the organ it is replacing. Here you see some of these ear structures that were printed. And you can see here that, in fact, they're built so that they have the same resiliency and elasticity as you would find in a normal ear. 
in a way, Star Trek predicted what we're doing today. I remember just 25 years ago that the concept of just growing a human cell was science fiction. And here we are today, not just growing human cells, but also printing tissues and organs. So 300 years from now, printing a body or certainly major parts of the body may be possible. We may even be looking at things beyond that. Yep, I'm back. So we, we saw a 3D printed nose and a 3D printed ear. Years and years ago, when I was teaching in New York City, in addition to teaching chemistry and physics, I also had to be teaching biology, earth science, uh, ecology, environmental science. And I remember in my environmental science class, we were talking about depletion of the ozone layer and how people were getting you know, overexposed to the sun and sunburn and skin cancer. And on People Magazine at the time, they had a picture of this woman. She was probably in her 20s. She had to have her nose cut off because it became all cancerous. Uh, back then, they did not have the ability to 3D print the nose, but it would have been something that she certainly could have used. And then there was Van Gogh who cut off his ear. I don't know what happened to that ear, but now we can 3D print an ear. Not to suggest that you cut off your ear, ear if you get upset about something. Okay, I'm going back to screen sharing. Uh, also note they said that the scaffolding of the nose in the air will be supplemented with the, the 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 person's own cells. This is very important, and that's going to come up a few times. You know, I'm not a medical person, but I'm just wondering if you do replace, let's say, an ear or a nose with this uh, computer-generated uh, nose or ear. What about the blood supply? Ah. Let's proceed, and the answer to that will be revealed. Okay? So, Bill, theoretically, it's possible to change or do away with your fingerprints then, right? Um, I think they could do that now. Change your fingerprints. Uh, you just burn them. You know, chemically burn them. But you, you're talking about doing a skin transplant? Yeah, if you're a criminal, you don't want, and you have your fingerprints on file, you just get, you know, you follow this procedure, you got new fingerprints. Uh huh. I'll send that into uh, Mr. Trump, see uh, what he thinks about that. You find when you get to our age, the fingerprints disappear from your hands anyway, naturally. Yep. <laughs> Bill, do any yes. of your videos um, show how they store this, the bio ink? I just read surprisingly online that the bio ink is stored at four degrees centigrade. I, I assume there would be liquid nitrogen way below zero. Do you have any videos on that or any knowledge of how it's stored? Um, well, you don't want to, you don't want it to end up freezing. So four degrees centigrade is about what your refrigerator is at which yeah. you're more familiar with 37 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's close to that, which it just means it's refrigerated. If you put it in liquid nitrogen, you might burn it. Yeah, I'm that's, thinking that's about- too cold. I'm thinking about the development of human embryos. The embryos, they store much colder temperatures. Well, I know that if you take strawberries or blueberries or, or fruit and you freeze it, what typically happens is the water inside the cells, uh, the water crystallizes sharp points and it punctures cellular membranes and turns your vegetables into your fruit into mush when you thaw it out. So there, there is damage there to make it too cold. But if anybody finds other information about that, I'd appreciate it because it, it was surprising to me. 
Well, folks, if I could have your attention, uh, we've gone through a number of these things. My wife is sitting next to me. She's a little choked up. And you probably are too. And am I amazing? Uh, so I ask you now, what do you think about 3D printing? And for each of you, I ask you to finish the sentence 3D printing. Change the words. And if you said that 3D printing is for the <laughs> birds, such as ducks and toucans and dogs and cats and tortoises, horses, elephants, and so many others, I'll show you why you are absolutely right. That's it. I, I can't believe it, but uh, I got everything covered that I thought we would. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed putting it together for you. I, I look forward to your response. Ralph, give me a little feedback. Everybody. Just amazing. I mean, you know, I didn't think they could, I didn't think they were at that stage. I mean, they could do all these things, especially with the animals and the, and the kid, stuff mm -hmm. like that. You know, it's really here as opposed to science fiction. John? Uh, the, the, the last one really touched me. Uh, and as I was thinking, I mean, the 3D printing is one thing, but uh, the question is about uh, blood supply to some of these things. I don't understand how they can do that. And this guy from uh, Future, what, uh, Unlimited Tomorrows, uh, he was shipping these things to people and they were just slipping them on their arms. I didn't understand how they learned to uh, make them operate. What is the connection between the mind and the movement of the device? Yeah, I was wondering uh, about that also. Does anybody have any input on that? Well, I know, <clears throat> I've seen um, some document uh, documentaries that um, talked about where, but they actually had some electrical connection between the arm and, and they'd done it to nerves and they, you know, they could use it, they could c control it individually, but they, that required attaching it to particular nerves. Our own uh, Harvey Phillips worked at Montgomery Home in the adaptive technology lab. And he did a lot of this stuff. I don't know how his health is these days, but he, he knows that kind of stuff. They, they control things with eye movements, with just slight muscle movements. Um, it's amazing what, what he did. And that was maybe, geez, 30, even maybe 40 years ago, you know, compared to what they're doing now. So uh, they used to call it simply adaptive technology. And now we're incorporating a lot more things with uh, adaptive technology. I was just searching the internet too and finding that uh, they're printing neurons for the, for the brain. Somebody has given us feedback, probably Andy. They're printing, they're printing new neurons for the brain. Um, so far I haven't seen a complete <laughs> brain transplant but uh this what you presented tonight bill was pretty amazing pretty amazing that's all i can say yeah i'm still i'm still stuck with the storage problem though that this this stuff has to work at room temperature and they're talking about now taking it on on space missions as well so it root has to work at room temperature and under extreme pressure uh, both high and low. This this is just incredible. There, but, there's lots of additional patient, lots of additional complications beyond just printing the device. Certainly, by being able to print the device so uh, easily and change the design of the device, you jump ahead in one area of the development very quickly. But that doesn't solve all the other areas that we're talking about. Uh, just genius takes takes a lot of additional work. 
Well, I hope everyone will do some further investigations into whatever interests them and maybe report back in September. Suji, Suji, would you like to give us any feedback yeah. about what you thought? Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, topic of prosthetics uh, has been around for a while, but it's just amazing how 3D printing has helped uh, make it available to so many people, right? I mean, I don't think uh, a, a long time ago, uh, for example, animals would have had that opportunity to have prosthetics built for them. But now because of 3D printing, it can be done pretty uh, inexpensively I and mean, still costs, uh, you know, I guess thousands of dollars, but uh, you know, it, it can be done. Uh, you don't have, you, you know, you don't have to hire a, a team of, uh, I guess, uh, medical staff to do it. Any Anybody with a good printer and uh, uh, I guess the right software and, and the right imagery as they showed us could, uh, could 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 build one of these things. So that's that that's the uh, you know the biggest takeaway I had is that you know I I built uh, you know in in my in my job uh, you know one time we built a prosthetic arm uh, as a team building effort and it took a long time to build it. We built it by hand. You know uh, I mean uh, and 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 I can imagine that whole process would be so much easier now with the three D printer. Yeah, and when you tie it in with the process of photogrammetry, so everything fits. Just right. Bill, any feedback from you, Bill? Well, just I had expressed a concern earlier uh, that it might be easy, uh, relatively speaking, to develop uh, 3D uh, printed, uh, let's, I'm thinking analogs, to cartilaginous flesh. Uh, but I was really skeptical that more complex organs could be uh, developed created yeah, especially with the blood vessels in them yes and yet it's happening i am very impressed mm -hmm. well how much how much does a 3d printer cost ah okay well it depends on what you want to go for you want to go for a volkswagen type or uh, <laughs> a lamborghini type uh, now one of the videos that i do have uh, is the, the future of 3D printing and how it's going to affect us in so many ways. That goes about half an hour. We don't have time for that. And one of the folders that I have is about how you could get started in 3D printing. You know, what devices are out there for the beginner uh, and uh, some other stuff. So if there's an interest, I'm going to ask you about that, whether or not you want to come back to this in September. Fred, you want to add anything here? Well, the only, the only other thing that you're mentioning having your own 3D printer, there are services out there. If you design something, and this is what Tim Zebo did, he designed something at one of our workshops. He showed us what he designed, and he had it printed by a service, and uh, it was easy peasy for him. I mean, I mean if you have a major undertaking, you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna want to have a uh, Bio printer. I'd love to have more knowledge about the bio inks. Um, that that to me is incredible, just incredible. Uh, I just checked on Amazon, and there are 3D printers. If you just look for a 3D printer, under $300. Some are 142 dollars. At least that's something that one can practice on and do small things. And uh, we talked about this in in some of your earlier presentations. Mm -hmm. that the uh the chemicals in the air the smell and the uh volatility of the chemicals is a problem of where you do it but a 3d printer for, to practice with is not expensive you're not mm -hmm. going to pr print a heart but well actually you could print a heart as a matter of yes. fact i have one well you can you're not going to print a real heart a useful part you're going to print a stool sample <laughs> i actually have a 3d printed heart it's about this big but uh, it is plastic uh richard a little feedback from australia oh well, you see i've got a 3d printer behind me that cost me about 700 dollars was uh to for use it for printing small plastic things so that's about 700 australian dollars not yeah. us dollars yeah um 
Uh, it's actually got an inbuilt camera as well, so you can actually, uh, well, uh, video the, uh, the whatever you're printing while, while 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 the printer is going on. So I haven't got it connected up at the moment, but um, I've done a couple of small things with it. Uh -huh. so, well, you know, before I moved away from Oldbridge, the Oldbridge Library actually had a 3D printer. They had like a lab there that you could uh, go in and play around with, you know, actually print things there. I don't know if any of the other libraries did anything like that, but this was like, I say, eight to 10 years ago. You know, Tanda, you had mentioned this a few months ago, and I went to our local library and spoke to the head of the Monmouth County Library System about getting a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, 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 they they give off these horrible fumes. I'm not going to do it like they did in Old Bridge. <laughs> so, thank you. Very good. Very nice seeing everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.